thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for attending today on what I hope will be quite an interesting talk on supplements. Um, this is one of my favorite lectures that I deliver um, to our master's cohort because ultimately it um, uh, descends into talking about different aspects of the murkier side of supplements and the good and the bad aspects. And, and we, we delve back into the 80s and 90s in the cycling history and, and things like that. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm a senior lecturer in sport and exercise nutrition. My main areas of research are looking at um, nutritional interventions to be able to improve the health and performance of endurance athletes. So typically we'll look at carbohydrate supplementation for our marathon runners, uh, or we'll look at factors on how hydration might, and dehydration might impact how the kidney functions during prolonged exercise. Um, so, like I said, today's talk is all about supplements. Uh, so I've titled it Supplements in Sport, Sport, Risk or Reward. And this is a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. So start with what is a supplement and look at the definition of how, how that's defined. Why athletes might supplement. Look at some supplements that work. So this can be quite a controversial area of, of where is the scientific evidence? What are we looking at when we, when we decide whether a supplement is worth taking or not? Look at the risk of supplements because they are not without um, problems a lot of the time. Um, look at some novel supplements, things that might be used in Tokyo. Uh, and also what can be really interesting from a sort of psychological and physiological effect is the, is the effect of a placebo. So how that factors into both the scientific research and also how that works for an athlete as well. So just to begin with, what is a supplement? So there was a really interesting paper published uh, three years ago now by, led by a professor um, who was at Loughborough uh, several years ago, uh, Professor Ron Morn, um, with a whole host of nutritional experts and looked at what a supplement actually is. So they aim to define it and they defined it as a food, a food component, nutrient or non-food compound that is purposely ingested in addition to the habitually consumed diet with the aim of achieving specific health and or performance benefit. So as you can see, almost extremely generic with, with the and broad with what a supplement could be. Um, so it could be just additions to your daily diets so and an additional food supplement. It could just be anything. It could be a, a herbal remedy. It could be a pill. It could be something more pharmaceutical. Um, but we tend to look at it as something that is additional. So we might take it as a carbohydrate supplement. So you might supplement extra carbohydrates in addition to what you ingest in your normal diet. And the aim is to improve either health and or performance. And just to give you a, a sort of brief overview of how big the supplement industry actually is. In 2018, there was a, um, an audit or, or a, a assessment conducted and the supplement industry was worth about $21 billion, billion and is expected to grow by about 11% every year from 2018 to 2025. So it's huge, big, big business. Um, many, many companies are creating products, trying to break into niche areas, trying to look at what can be the next big product that will sell. And you can see for yourselves how supplements are, are becoming more mainstream. We're seeing them away from the niche um, shops and online stores and starting to see them in supermarkets. I go to my local supermarket, you walk through one aisle and you're hit with 40, 50, 60 different supplements from protein supplements to probiotics to vitamins to minerals. There's a whole aisle dedicated to it now just before the fruit and veg. So it is big business. And one difference, um, I suppose, to this with compared to the food industry is that a lot of the supplement industry is, is slightly unregulated. So there can be a lot more freedom to try and create things, to try and put something in a gap in the market or to try and find a product that potentially works from a health or a performance aspect. Um, but that can also be problematic in the long run as well. If it's, if it's not as well regulated as food and there's unsubstantiated claims, then, then we start to have problems, particularly from a, an ethical and, a, and a, a doping perspective. So I try to kind of break down the supplements or kind of give a, 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 an overview of where they range from. And 
I started with what I would term as food on the left hand side, where you might add something additional to your diet, you might take extra fruit and vegetables in, you might add extra protein in, in terms of an extra chicken breast at dinner or something like that. So you're using food as your main sort of source of supplementation. And this spectrum goes right down to the pharmaceutical aspect where you might look at ingesting some proper pharmaceutical grade pills such as analgesics, um, such as vitamins that are all pre, pre um, uh, developed by pharmaceutical companies and have that sort of appearance to them. And then we get to the middle areas where I've kind of I've got pictures of what I term carbohydrate drinks and, and caffeine, but these are ultimately very interchangeable. Carbohydrate might be seen as more of a food. You might take that as real food during a bike race or an endurance running race, or you might see it as a powder and, and flip this around with caffeine. Additionally, caffeine, depending on the dose, might, might come to more towards this pharmaceutical aspect, or it might come to more towards the food. So if we take caffeine as coffee, then that's just a normal diet. And if you take an extra cup, uh, coffee then it's additional to the daily diet but if you're taking pure caffeine powder then it's more towards the pharmaceutical uh, side of things then we have this um, picture of uh, uh, plant or herbal type medicines so you concentrate a, an active ingredient down uh, such as a, a herbal medicinal element and, and take that um, as part of your supplement um, protocol but with this, we always bring the question back to athletes and say, should there be a food first approach? Can we focus on this as an athlete and get what we need from food? Do we have to go down this supplement aspect? Do we need to add extra carbohydrate in? Do we need to take these herbal remedies in? Do we need to supplement with, with pills and tablets, et cetera? Most nutritionists would would advocate this side of things, looking at how we take a food first approach. So this would be most people's first um, go-to point, uh, looking at can we supplement or can we just improve diet and create a more balanced diet with the required nutrients um, for each sport. And a question, I suppose the question is why do athletes supplement? Um, again, we come back to this food first approach and we go, well, where does supplementation fit in? Where does nutrition fit in? Where does it fit in this uh, sort of continuum of athletic performance? Um, are we supplementing to make up for shortfalls in the diet? Are we doing it to mitigate some of the effects of training that we're not doing or factors like that? So if you were to take an athlete, the first question would be, how's your training? Is your training optimum? Then you go, are you talented? Do you have the talent to be able to develop? Is your general nutrition okay? Are you in the right environment? Have you got the right coaching setup? Are you doing the right coaching for you? Then do we go, right, once we've looked at nutrition, are there any deficiencies in that? Do we need to take additional supplementation? So there was a survey conducted about 10, 15 years ago now in, in athletics and looking at who took supplements. And about 85% of the respondents took um, some form of supplement and they didn't necessarily specify how wide ranging this was but it included protein powders it included carbohydrates so we have that sort of difficulty in in the definition of what we would class as a specifically a supplement or what an athlete might class as specifically a supplement so many of them so using dietary supplements typically it was to aid in recovery from training so a lot of athletes will take in some form of protein or carbohydrate immediately after training and use supplementation as an easy way of doing this so it's often a lot easier to take on a protein shake than to get home and cook yourself a meal and then that kind of leads on to the next one of convenience um, improve health improve performance some of them was to prevent or treat an illness. So they might be taking vitamin C, vitamin D, or even carbohydrate to try and prevent illness. Or a lot of them, a third of them, to compensate for a poor diet. Additionally, you might get that athletes are taking dietary supplements because of the sponsorship financial gain. Um, I've just seen a video today of Cristiano Ronaldo moving a sports drink, uh, moving a soft drink from in front of him during his press conference. So whether that was due to health reasons or whether he was sponsored by an uh, alternative brand is, is open to interpretation. But a lot of athletes are sponsored by companies and supplements, so they need to be seen to be taking them or at least have the bottles indicating that they, they use those products. Some of the athletes take it just because 
they just in case. So they go, well, we might need to take something because someone else is taking it. If other competitors are using it, then athletes might supplement for that reason. And you kind of split this into two supplement viewpoints. On the left-hand side, we have the, the athlete viewpoint. And on the right-hand side, we have the, the science viewpoint, looking at it from a scientific perspective and seeing if there is actual evidence for, for what we're looking at. And I think from an athlete perspective, it's more a case of, is this going to make me faster? With the addition of, do I think it's going to make me faster or higher or jump higher or go further or have greater fatigue resistance? So if there's that psychological aspect of it, then the supplement seems to work from that viewpoint. So as long as the perception is there that it's improving performance, that's all an athlete or a coach might really look at. Yes, there are um, connotations in terms of health and the risk of taking some supplements in terms of contamination, but they don't necessarily have to work physiologically. They don't have to have the evidence surrounding them if an athlete perceives them to be, to be very helpful. I've heard tales of several nutritionists go into clubs and athletes will pick out X, Y, Z times by a hundred different pills that they have in their bags just because they think they might be doing something. When really it, it comes down to do they actually need, need that? And this can probably be broken down into, into a few, into a few uh, viewpoints. If it works, it's probably banned. If it's not banned, it probably doesn't work. But there may be a few exceptions. So three very simple rules that an athlete might want to look at. And then we have the, the science approach. So we have the fact that as a scientist, we will look at, well, what is that supplement potentially doing to the body? Is there physiological rationale? So we tend to follow slightly different aspects. We first thing is to go, is there a specific biochemical and or physiological function that the supplement is aimed at? Does it have rationale to work in that scenario? So a sprinter might need something very different to an endurance athlete. And therefore, if we understand the physiology, we can understand how the supplement might work. The next question is, does it reach its target tissue? So if it's needed in the muscles, can we actually get that supplement into the muscles? There are some things, and we'll talk about them later, where you need a lot more help to get that um, supplementation into where it needs to get to. And once it gets there, does it actually increase to a meaningful amount to make a difference? You might get some of it in, but if it's not doing anything to, to help out and there's not enough of it, then you perhaps not, you're wasting your time. Is there a consistent effect on physiological function? So if we took this five, six, seven, eight times, is it doing the same thing? And also is that then having a resultant effect on performance? We've seen several studies where you might get a, an increase in the physio physiological marker that you're after, i.e. a blood marker might go up or a blood marker might go down. But if it doesn't have any effect on performance, then, then there's no point in taking the supplement. So we have to ask all these questions. And then we've, we have to factor in who it might benefit as well. So there, there needs to be a lot more work on sort of males versus females to look at how uh, different hormones influence how a supplement might act and also how elites versus non-elites work. We do most of our scientific experimentation on um, 18 to 25 year old males from that are university students. We don't do it on elite athletes, which is perhaps where we want to deliver, where we want that ultimate um, effect to be found. Um, there is some evidence with beetroot juice, for instance, that it works more effectively on recreational athletes than on elite athletes because they're, um, they have more room for improvement. Their pathways are less developed than elite ath athletes so that the beetroot juice has a, has a ben more beneficial effect. And we can kind of uh, look at this in terms of evidence and we can, we can delve into the types of um, evidence that a supplement might have. And just to briefly go over this, it's at the bottom, you have the very low levels of evidence. You have opinions and ideas and anecdotes that so-and-so, that this supplement X worked in in so-and-so because they ran five seconds faster, but you forget to um, control for everything else, such as shoes or anything like that, or weather conditions or fitness or training or anything like that. And then where we tend to look at is looking at these control trials. So we can give, um, we can perhaps do two trials 
in a group of people and they act as their own control and we will give an intervention in one condition in one day and then a week later we might do the same test but without that intervention so we can compare supplement x versus either a placebo or no no supplement uh, and we can have a look at the effect on a group of people then we get this at the top level of evidence, which are meta-analyses and systematic reviews, where they group together several papers looking at several different studies to try and give an overarching view on whether that supplement has any effect or not. So in terms of supplements that work, there are very few and far and, and, and not many. Um, there are a few that might at the present time be considered to have an adequate level of support to look at marginal performance gains. And these include caffeine, creatine, nitrate, sodium bicarbonate, and possibly also beta alanine. So we are very few supplements have that much scientific evidence behind them. And a great resource for this is recently updated Australian Institute for Sport framework, where they really um, go to town for their athletes and, and break down everything um, in terms of supplements that work, supplements that don't work into four groups. So the first group is group A, and, and this has strong evidence. So this might be caffeine, it might be nitrates. Um, there is strong evidence, the scientific literature backs it up, um, uh, and you can be confident that this supplement will probably benefit performance if taken correctly. Group B is a list of emerging evidence. So we might have some supplements that are work in certain situations, but there needs to be more work done on this. Group C is often no evidence, so there is no beneficial effect with taking them or not taking them. And then group D, they, they call banned or high risk. So this might be some of the, the uh, steroid containing products that are out there or some of the things like amphetamines or, or banned drugs uh, from a legal perspective. So they advise everyone to stay away from these. So what I thought I would do is give you a couple of examples, one from group A and one from group B, just to give you a bit of context about what we're looking at in terms of the supplement. So um, we could go, there is the list of supplements is endless. So I thought I would, I would pick a couple that are quite interesting and we've done some recent work on and, and, and can have a look at. Um, so caffeine is the first one, um, partly because the evidence is very, very good for caffeine. Um, it is we all, a lot of people take caffeine in the form of coffee or tea or even chocolate or Coca-Cola or things like that. Um, and the evidence is very, very good for it. Now, caffeine works, it's one of the most consumed sports supplements. Uh, it can be taken in a variety of forms in addition to coffee and tea. So you might take it as a caffeine powder or you might take it as, as gum. Um, so there's lots of research, lots of evidence and, and looking at the mechanisms. So the process by how it can improve performance. So the primary mechanism is that it affects the central nervous system. So we call it an adenosine receptor antagonist. So the adenosine receptor, when that's activated, it can sort of slow the body down, make it more relaxed, uh, make it calm. But if you buffer that or prevent it by, by caffeine being an antagonist, so adenosine can't bind to the receptor, then you reduce that calming effect and you create a stimulating effect. So the central nervous system is, um, the effect is increased, the activity is increased. So you become more alert, you reduce the perceptions of fatigue um, and you can improve performance in terms of that effect. There is some evidence in some cases that there is an increase in the mobilization of fats. So we could, in so, uh, at high doses, there's been some old work in, in individuals that you might also be able to increase free fatty acid availability, which can then, um, if you can use that as a substrate source, so when you exercise, if you can burn fat rather than carbohydrates, then you can potentially spare your carbohydrates for later on in exercise. But this seems to be a bit more refuted now, and there's not that much evidence. So when they tend to give people caffeine now in either coffee or a caffeine dose. They tend to see similar carbohydrate use and similar fat use between different people. Now, caffeine is a really interesting one because there's lots of factors to consider. We've talked about the form, whether how that creates bioavailability and how that might be ingested, but there's also the dose as well. So caffeine is typically given in milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So normally we talk about three to six milligrams per kilogram. 
um, being an effective dose, but there has been more recent work looking at even smaller amounts. The other thing is habituation. So we can get users and non-users. So people can become accustomed to caffeine. So you become accustomed to the, for those of you who are regular coffee and tea drinkers, when you don't have your coffee and tea, you get a headache, withdrawal, you feel slightly fatigued. So it can become awesome, almost an addictive uh, drug. So you become habituated to the caffeine. And we also see users and non-users, or people who use it and take part in studies, or people who are not non-users and take part in studies. And we also see responders and non-responders. So some people will respond really well to caffeine, whereas some people won't respond really well. We also have studies where we put them in the fed or the fasted state. So they might have breakfast before, they might not have breakfast, which can, can affect what substrates they use in the body and can also affect how, they, um, how the caffeine interacts. So I've just got a couple of study results. So this is looking, and this is a classic study looking at caffeine and performance. So on the left-hand side is a figure where um, they ingested caffeine 60 minutes before uh, a period of exercise. Um, they did 15, 15 minutes of exercise and then, and then went to exhaustion at high intensity. And what this is looking at is the amount of caffeine in the blood. And so for each dose, so they took either no caffeine, three milligrams per kilogram, six milligrams per kilogram, or nine milligrams per kilogram. And just to give you a bit of context, a shot of the three shots of espresso is about 200 milligrams. Obviously, co coffee is not as um, consistent in terms of caffeine delivery, but a shot of espresso is probably about 70 to 80 milligrams or 60, 60 to 70 milligrams. So they were taking on lots of shots of espresso in caffeine form. And what we see is a peak, caffeine tends to peak in the blood after about an hour. So this is why we suggest to athletes to take on caffeine about an hour before you need it, because that's when it's highest in your blood and that's where it's going to be more effective. So what they did was they looked at performance um, and time to exhaustion. So how long they could run for following caffeine ingestion of different doses. And they saw that when they took on three and six milligrams per kilogram of body mass, they saw an improvement in performance compared to no caffeine. They also saw a difference. Um, they saw no increase at nine. So it was similar to baseline at nine. So perhaps there's too much of a good thing with caffeine um, and that it didn't further improve performance. So you have the, the, the difficulty of also blinding subjects to taking on nine milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. That's a lot of caffeine and they're probably shaking and going the other way. Um, so we can see that this seems to be the optimum dose, but we have seen evidence recently where one milligram per kilogram might be effective. I talked a little bit about habituation and I thought I'd bring up this study that uh, we conducted uh, six or seven years ago now looking at how um, athletes might become habituated to caffeine and how, might, how that might negate the effects of caffeine. So what the athletes did was they did a um, time trial um, or they did a, a capacity test of how far they could cycle in about 15 to 20 minutes or 60 minutes, 30 minutes, sorry, cycle for 30 minutes, and they measured the amount of work produced, so the amount of energy that was produced during this time. They then did the trial um, again with caffeine and saw an improvement in performance. So these bars are compared to white bar to white bar, black bar to black bar. So when they took caffeine on before the trial, they improved the performance. What they then did was they did four weeks of supplementation. So between this trial and this trial, we got one group to take on one milligram, um, a small amount of caffeine per day or twice a day versus a group which just took a placebo. So after four weeks of a very incremental amount of caffeine, so they, become, they had a little bit in their system every day and they became accustomed to it. What we actually saw was that in the placebo group, the white bars were the same. So their performance was still similar. But in the caffeine trial, they saw a reduction in performance. So that habituation to caffeine over a four week period actually reduced performance. So we saw, so you can become habituated to it and in the end develop a tolerance to low caffeine, um, 
develops tolerance to it, which doesn't make it as effective as it would be if you hadn't used it. So for those athletes who are continually consuming carbohydrate, uh, caffeine, coffees and caffeine, they may not be getting the same benefits as if they were completely withdrew, didn't have any caffeine and only really used it for their competitions. So it seems to be that chronic ingestion um, can uh, blunt performance to a certain extent. Now, the next one I want to talk about is carnitine, because this is not only is it an interesting from a supplement perspective, but it also has connotations in terms of the media and recent athletes and high level coaches in America in terms of their use of it. So carnitine is a uh, substance that is uh, found in uh, muscles and uh, skeletal muscle and cardiac tissue, and it helps to transport long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria. So just to briefly go through this diagram, we have the circulation, so which is the blood, and then we have the cell, the, or the muscle cell. So this is uh, the outside of the muscle cell, and this is the mitochondria. So this below this line is the mitochondria. So basically, this is the engine house. This is where we need to get our um, glycogen uh, in terms of, uh, or where we need to get carbohydrates or fatty acids into the mitochondria to be able to generate energy for muscular contraction. So carnitine acts in this area here in the cytosol of the cell of the muscle. And its primary aim is to get fatty acids from this area into the lower area, into the mitochondria. Because fatty acids can't get through this membrane. They can't get through uh, the membrane from the cytosol into the mitochondria on their own. So we can't use fatty acids just on their own to get into the, into the engine of the cell. So we need to use carnitine, which combines with the fatty acids to form acyl, uh, which combines with acyl-CoA to form acyl-carnitine, which can then transport the fatty acids into, into, the, into the mitochondria. So, in order to improve the amount of carnitine in here to help that transport of fatty acids, we need to um, uh, increase our, our ingestion rate of carnitine. And carnitine is typically found in red meats and we normally get enough through the diet, but there has been some research about supplementation with carnitine. And it seems to be that carnitine is uptaken into the muscle uh, and cardiac tissue by increasing insulin. So if we can increase the insulin in the blood, we can then increase the carnitine into the cell. The carnitine can then help transport more fatty acids into the mitochondria. And hopefully we can use more fatty acids to produce energy and therefore save some of our muscle glycogen, which is our, our coming from our carbohydrate stores, which will help later on in exercise. Now to increase insulin in the muscle, in the blood, there is one of two ways. We can either exercise or we can ingest um, things like carbohydrates, which will increase insulin and therefore we can increase carnitine, carnitine uptake into the muscle. Now, there's a really interesting study that Nottingham done, so not, the University of Nottingham and uh, Paul Greenhouse lab did a lot of work looking at carnitine. And they looked at how they could get carnitine into the muscle. And the best way, or one of the ways they looked at was looking at providing intravenous insulin. So this figure shows muscle, total muscle carnitine, um, so the more we have, the better it is. And this is the insulin infusion rate. So this is normal insulin levels, and this is massively increased insulin levels. And they saw that if they were able to, over a 12 hour period, if they were able to increase the insulin infusion rate or keep it high, and therefore keep insulin high in the blood, they could really increase muscle carnitine. The problem with this is that that brings out the legality in sports question. If you are taking on an intravenous injection, so putting a needle in your arm to ingest fluids, to put fluids in, then that contravenes the World Anti-Doping Agency um, laws, where you can only have an infusion of 100 mil every 12 hours. Um, so it really brings into question the legality. So elite athletes couldn't use this method because it contravenes um, anti-doping laws. So the alternative is to look at increasing insulin 
through ingestion of carbohydrate. So they did another similar study where to increase the insulin, they ingested 80 grams of carbohydrate and L-carnitine or 80 grams of carbohydrate for 24 weeks. And over time, this figure at the bottom shows total carnitine. And if we see after 24 weeks, when they had the carbohydrate and carnitine, they were able to really increase total carnitine. So we saw a big increase in muscle carnitine per day. And then when it came to a performance test, again, after 24 weeks, we saw this increase in performance when carnitine was ingested with carbohydrate. Now, there are issues with this in terms of um, the amount of carbohydrate that's being ingested per day. Um, so you're talking 160 grams of carbohydrate, which is approximately um, 600 extra calories a day. So a huge amount of carbohydrate going into the body to be able to increase muscle carnitine over a six month period by a relatively small amount. Now, what they did do was because of this um, finding, not, University of Nottingham actually developed a drink that was um, had carnitine carbohydrate in that they could use for athletes. They took this, they might be able to improve their muscle carnitine and therefore improve their ability to use fats. Now this was picked up by, this is where the, the perhaps the, the first of my risks comes into things. So this is where we start to see the murkier side. And this is a picture of Alberto Salazar, uh, the, the track and field coach, former marathon uh, runner and world record holder, I think he was world record holder, um, and former coach of uh, Mo Farah and, uh, well, and Galen Rupp. And he started buying carnitine drinks and providing them to the athletes and using them, but they didn't see any imp improvement in performance or they didn't get on with them. Um, so he also allegedly, and it came out in the WADA report, the World Anti-Doping Agency report, that he tested on not athletes, so the athletes weren't implicated in this, but other guinea pigs within his um, organization, his track and field club, infusion of um, L uh, in insulin and L-carnitine ingestion to see if that had an effect on performance. And they did see an improvement in, in performance in, in very, very, in one case study, I think, on one of his, uh, his junior coaches. Um, and But the anti-doping agency saw this as a contravene of the rules and the implication was that it was going to be used on athletes and it was against the, the, the rules because they ingested, uh, they infused more um, insulin than they should have done or more fluid than they should have done. And therefore he was hit with a big doping ban. So carnitine on its own as a drink is absolutely fine. But when it's ingested, when insulin is uh, infused, then it becomes a whole different topic of conversation. And that kind of brings us to the risks of supplements. Now, elite sport is governed by the World Anti-Doping Agency. So they, they do doping tests, they look at um, adverse findings, they pull athletes up, uh, they ban them, they follow athletes, they look at blood passports, they look at um, uh, blood tests, urine tests. Um, and there is strict liability with athletes. They are completely responsible for what is ingested in their body. And this was no more topical than a study that, uh, than a, a news report that came out today, looking at uh, one of the athletes in America who failed a test for, for meat contamination. Um, so if you fail a drugs test, supplements can potentially increase the risk of a failed drugs test, possibly because the regulations aren't as tight. So sometimes companies will add an illegal product to the, to the supplement to increase its potency. Um, or they may just get cross-contamination from things. So if you say, for instance, a pharmaceutical company is preparing legitimate me medicines for a hospital to, to keep people alive, and some of those are on the anti-doping list, and they also have a, a sub-company where they also produce um, sports products, you would hope that they weren't produced in the same factory, but you never know that there might may be some level of contamination. And if athletes fail a drugs test, they're often banned for, for two to four years. And there's no there's n uh, strict liability. I, I provide this example of two British track athletes who were banned for four and six months because they took a product which they thought there was, um, was safe. Um, they thought it had been tested to, to be um, considered 
um, okay to use, that it didn't have any banned contaminants in, but it was found to have anabolic steroids in their urine samples. Um, they thought the product was what we call informed sport tested. So you can send a batch of the product off to a company and they will look for any um, contaminants in there and provide a report and say it's safe to be used. But when they actually did the research, they were told the company had not paid for it to be tested by informed sport and therefore it didn't have its certificate. But because they'd taken the, the products themselves, they were on strict liability and they were resulted in two bans. Uh, which cost them um, selection for major championships. And contamination is quite a big issue. Um, in a study that was conducted uh, 15 years ago or so, they looked at 600 products. Uh, they found from the internet, they found from different companies all over Europe and tested them. 94, so 15% of them contain some aspects of pro-hormones not declared on the label. So steroids, um, pro-hormones, anything that might result in a banned test. A lot of them had low levels of concentration, but some of them had very high concentrations that would typically result in a banned um, drugs test. And so about the same time or just after, um, Loughborough was um, asked to conduct some studies looking at the effects of contamination. And one of the hormones or one of the, the steroids that they looked at was a uh, nandrolone, which was big at that time in terms of several um, failed tests for um, very high profile um, sports stars, including Greg Rizetsky, Pep Guardiola, Peter Corda. Um, they all failed a test for nandrolone based on contaminating products. So Greg Rosetsky, for instance, was given an electrolyte drink by the trainer from the ATP. Um, and it was found to have um, nandrolone in. Uh, and so he, he had some contamination in his uh, sports drink. So what the aim of the studies was to look at was to look at how much nandrolone is required in terms of contamination to produce a failed um, drugs test. So they did three studies. Uh, in, one of the, in the first study, they looked at how this, um, how nandrolone might peak in the urine concentration just with ingesting a very, very small amount. So this figure shows the concentration of uh, a precursor in the urine, and this is the time after the first dose. This black line is what would trigger a failed drugs test. So if the, if the urine sample provided had a concentration greater than this band line, that would produce a failed drug test. And the amount of uh, contaminant, contamination in the product that they provided was very, very small, 10 micrograms, a, a tiny, tiny amount. And the subgroup in this study took it on two different occasions. So they took it on day one and they took it on day two, uh, day five. And you can see that first two, two urine samples immediately after ingestion produced a band test. So looking at sort of two to five hours afterwards, produce a band, uh, a failed drugs test. And again, the same response seen when they took it five days later, spike over the threshold, failed test, just from a very, 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 very low amount. The second study was looking at the effect of how much is required. So they looked at even smaller amounts. So one, 2.5 and five micrograms. So some of these, one and 2.5, are sometimes below the detection limit of um, companies that test the products in the first place to check if they're safe or not. Fortunately, under a one microgram, there was no failed test, but at 2.5 micrograms, 25% of the people failed a test, whereas at five, so half of the first study, 75% failed a test. So it's very, very small amounts that can build up uh, and create a failed drugs test. So looking at the very, very small amounts. Now this is really topical because just yesterday, one of the um, uh, medal favorites in the 1500 meters, Shelby Houlihan, a uh, US 1500 meter and 5,000 meter record holder, was given a four year ban by WADA for a failed drugs test based on a positive test for nandrolone. So she was informed of the decision in January and uh, looked at when, what happened to why she had perhaps failed a test for nandrolone. And she narrowed it down to a burrito that she'd had 10 hours before um, she gave the sample. 
um, and they looked at this and it was she'd had a burrito from a Mexican food cart that um, served pig offal as part of their meat. Sounds enticing. Um, and pigs or pig offal has been reportedly to be injected with nandrolone to help with some way to develop the meat or, or something like that. And it turned out the pork or, or they believed the pork was contaminated. So because it's strict liability and there are other reasons possibly to come out that we don't know about, this has resulted in a four year ban. So unfortunately, because the Olympics are delayed, she then loses this Olympics and the Paris Olympics. And it's very difficult to determine if she's um, actually failed the test for, for reasons of doping and she has taken Nandrolone or whether it might be just um, a fault at the testing to, to a real adverse effect in terms of eating contaminated pork. There have been several studies of contaminated meat, and these are normally from unregulated companies, such as uh, countries such as Mexico, China, and Spain, where cows and can often be um, injected with steroids to increase meat content. And athletes have eaten them and failed tests for those. Um, but this was provided in the Pacific Northwest. So um, this is case is going to roll on, but unfortunately, she misses the Olympics this year uh, and was, say, medal favorite for it. Some of them aren't so clear cut. So in terms of contaminated meat, I always like to throw this example into my uh, lectures. Uh, David Martinez, a Spanish discus thrower, um, ate contaminated pork, so similar, similar response, uh, and failed a test for nandrolone. Um, his method of trying to prove it was to inject a pig with nandrolone repeatedly to then eat it and try and fail another test. But unfortunately, he passed the drugs test. So he kind of uh, called his own bluff on that one. So I'm not sure where that ended up, but he ended up with a ban uh, and didn't compete in the 90s. So what can athletes do? Well, in terms of contaminated meat, not a lot. Um, <laughs> you try and eat as regulated places as much as possible. If in doubt and you're in a different country and you don't know if the meat regulation is there, then it can be very, very difficult. In Tokyo, any sensible athlete will ensure that all their products that they are taking are batch tested. So if they are sensible with it, they will take their own supplements with them that they've had batch tested here in the UK or in other countries that they are confident that they don't have any contaminants in there. They say this as an example, um, in the 2002 Winter Olympics, Alan Baxter, the skier, um, took a, um, a nasal in uh, aspirate uh, sort of decongestant he takes it in the uk all the time um it's fine here um it doesn't have any banned ingredients but he took one in america and it did have an additional ingredient in and therefore he failed the test it was actually eventually cleared but failed the test at the time after he just won a historic bronze medal in the slalom and had to give his medal up um, so it's important to test the product that you're going to have and not assume that products in other countries are going to be the same. So I'd imagine most of them are going to take their own products. After that, you're kind of eating sensibly in regulated places, uh, ensuring that there's nothing contaminated and avoiding open water bottles. I saw Mo Farah at the World Championships in 2017 uh, had his water bottles in locked boxes so they couldn't be spiked or anything like that. But the key with Tokyo is that perhaps we're looking at different aspects. We're looking at how we can supplement from a different perspective or what the, the requirements of Tokyo are, and it's going to be hot and humid. So unless a supplement is going to be beneficial from a hot and humid environment, there's going to be more concentration on other factors, such as fluid ingestion, cooling strategies, ice slurries, everything around that. For the distance events, Tokyo is going to be very attritional it's going to be a focus on ensuring hydration is good, ensuring carbohydrate is good, so that because they are burned through quite quick during exercise in the heat. And I put this picture on the right hand side with a question mark because this lends itself to the sort of murky world of when, when is ethical to take a, an additional supplement. Now, acetaminophen or aspirin has been shown in some studies to be beneficial for exercise in the heat in terms of, because it can help reduce fever and aspects like that. It can, um, it can potentially, or it has been shown to reduce 
pore temperature and um, skin temperature and perception of thermal comfort and therefore it help improve performance. However, there are many ethical and moral decisions to be based on this. Should you be taking things like aspirin as a performance enhancer? Probably not. Should you be, the body is well versed at providing a pretty good safety mechanism for exercise in the heat. So should we be overriding that to push our athletes further than they perhaps should in the heat? Probably not. So even though some things might work, there are many ethical and moral considerations around them. And things like aspirin and analgesics are very common in different endurance events. And that brings us on to the health issues that supplements might have. Like I said, acetaminophen or aspirin has mixed evidence. Some suggest it might, some suggest it might not, that it can improve performance in the heat. But you have to bring in the safety of the athlete. There are many other factors that can be improved before you start heading up some of these factors. In endurance events, um, ibuprofen and other non-steroid anti-inflammatories are quite commonly ingested, partly because athletes are trying to mask pain or in, run through injuries or, or try and prevent um, soreness during races but these can have adverse effects on things like the kidney so anti-inflammatories can be notoriously bad for the kidney uh, and we've recently done a study that we're just preparing at the moment where we looked at a single dose of ibuprofen and how that impacted how the kidney functions when you were um, hydrated or drinking a copious amount of water during it during a run and what we saw is that in the kidney, um, the kidney is uh, sort of the amount of blood going through the kidney is kind of uh, controlled by what we call prostaglandins. If these are elevated, we can maintain renal perfusion so we can maintain the blood flow going through the kidney. But what anti inflammatories can do is suppress this concentration of prostaglandins. If we suppress that, then we are potentially decreasing renal perfusion and therefore potentially decreasing renal function. So if we combine this with high fluid intakes, then if the kidney is not working effectively, then we can end up in quite severe situations where we, we call it water intoxication. Um, and we can have uh, serious conditions such as death. Um, so it can be quite a, a, a factor for healthcare. Um, and it's not to mention the fact the ibuprofen can increase the leakiness of the gut as well. So all these factors with supplements can have negative health impacts as well. And at the real extremes, we go back to the 90s in, in terms of, or not the 90s, the 60s in terms of the unregulation of doping and cycling. And Tommy Simpson, who was quite open about his doping and died on the bike after a cocktail of amphetamines and alcohol. Uh, unfortunately lost his life but did bring in greater regulations or, or I say greater some regulations in terms of doping and cycling um, but it resulted in in a bit more uh, control over it now I just want to talk one last thing about products in terms of um, one that's been had quite a bit of research recently in terms of ketones so ketones are um, an energy source in the body. Um, we tend to produce ketone bodies when we go on a low carbohydrate diet. So the body in a state of ketosis, it's called, when there's low carbohydrate, will produce ketone bodies and we can use those to fuel the muscles. And this has got quite topical recently because several cycling teams have used it. Several athletes did it in London Olympics. Um, it can help athletes go a bit further and faster. It can help preserve your carbohydrate stores in your muscles and use an alternative, uh, uh, alternative source of energy. Now, this is quite a com over complicated slide, but what it does is it suggests it is looking at the process of how we use carbohydrates or glucose which we have glycolysis converted to pyruvate, which uh, goes into this energy cycle. So this is what's happening in the muscles, in the mitochondria, as I mentioned earlier, and this produces our energy. So if we can get the carbohydrates into here, we can produce our energy that way. Now where ketone bodies come in is that they come into here. So they, they increase the acetyl-CoA, they block this off. So they block this pathway off and then feed in here and create the energy this way. So we, we don't use the carbohydrate stores. And this was quite nicely shown in, in a couple of studies that were done in Oxford, where they developed this special drink, um, where they looked at either using feeding a drink of carbohydrate 
for ketone bodies and carbohydrate. And the black bars are the amount of um, muscle glycogen, so the stores of carbohydrate in the muscle that were left at the end of this two hours of exercise. So with ketones, we still had a large amount of muscle glycogen left in. So we're preserving our energy stores by taking on these ketone bodies. Now, just quickly, we, this has been shown to be mostly effective in fasted exercise. Um, this study, uh, so what it does effectively is you provide the drink and it raises your ketone bodies in the blood. And then if you focus down here, it increased distance completed in, in a, in a uh, time trial, distance covered. So in a fasted state, it seems to work quite effectively. But when we do it in a fed state where we have breakfast beforehand, we still get the same increase in blood markers, the top figure. But what we don't get is an improvement in performance. So we don't tend to see. So it doesn't seem to work in the fasted state, possibly because we're providing carbohydrates beforehand. And that is the preferred source of fuel. And then finally, just want to touch on the placebo effect. The placebo effect is great for athletes if it works fantastic. And we often use the placebo, uh, a placebo as a way to control our trials. What we don't want to do in, in, in scientific studies is provide one drink and someone knows they're getting that drink or that supplement and therefore they go faster or they go longer or they go harder. So we try and always provide a placebo condition where they think they're getting something or they don't know that it's not the trial. And, uh, uh, and that can offset and we can look at the physiological mechanisms of why something's making us go faster. So placebo is Latin for I shall be pleasing. Um, so in effect, it can be really effective for athletes and coaches because they don't, as long as they're going faster, that's all they need to know. It doesn't have to work necessarily from a physiological standpoint, but from a science point of view, we want to look at that. And I want to pick this study. This, I, this is a really sort of fun study that a former student did, uh, his PhD down in uh, Westminster in Loughborough College, and that was published recently looking at drink perception. So they provided, they got, groups of people and they gave them a non um, caloric drink so uh, artificially sweetened and they had two drinks one was clear and one was pink so they just added a few cups of uh, food coloring to it to make it pink and they asked both of them to both the subjects to mouth rinse before they did uh, to run as far as they could in 30 minutes and when it was pink they ran a lot further so the perception of thinking about the placebo effect of thinking about a drink being pink and containing good stuff, um, improve performance. And just to show that there is a physiological effect, um, if we look at when it's longer and the placebo effect doesn't always work, so we actually have reliance on muscle glycogen stores and we provide water or a placebo which has no energy or a carbohydrate source which has some energy in, that when the exercise is long enough, so two hours, that placebo effect doesn't work. So we do get what we expect to see. So just to quickly summarize, um, in some situations, some supplements can be beneficial to exercise performance. However, it's important to focus on all aspects that contribute to performance. Supplements are not without risk and therefore the athlete and support network must decide on the risk and reward of using supplements. And it's important to consider the placebo effect. And this can be viewed differently from an athlete coach scientist perspective. So thank you all for listening. I hope that was of some interest. My contact details are here and that's my Twitter handle. If anyone wants to send me an email or ask questions at a later date. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a really, really interesting talk. I certainly really enjoyed it. Um, we've got a few minutes to take questions, uh, if anybody does have any. So if you would like to ask a question, could you please raise your hand and then um, I will come to you and ask you to unmute. So if you click on the reactions tab, you should find the raise hand option um, under there. So if anybody does have any questions, if you could raise your hand now, um, we've probably got time to do do a couple before we need to wrap it up. Sorry, it went on a bit long. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not at all. It was really, really interesting, and it was very topical that you've managed to put in the news from uh, Shelby Houlihan's uh, test yeah. recently as well. So it's uh, quite a topical time for this talk, I think. Frantically um, updating slides this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I did think that somebody has a hand raised, but I can't see who it is.
Alison, you've turned your camera on. Did you have a question? Yes, we have received one. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. Uh, just uh, Steve, could you answer, should um, athletes in different sports take different supplements? Um, yes, definitely. Um, each sport has different physiological requirements. So an endurance athlete has very different, uses very different energy systems to a sprinter, for instance. And it's about understanding those energy systems so that you have the appropriate supplement that's going to work. So for an endurance athlete, they're heavily reliant on carbohydrate stores. So you want to ingest carbohydrate as a supplement. But for a sprinter using the ATP PCR system, which is very powerful and rapidly generating, then something like creatine might be more, is going to be more beneficial to them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christine, did you have a question? Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Very interesting. I was wondering, have you done any research on, you know, Masters athletes, those of us who continue way into our 60s, 70s and 80s and beyond? And, you know, we don't get regulated at all with anything on or tested. So I was, it's just an, an interesting thought. We did some work at St George's on, on, our, on Heart with Professor Sharma. Okay. Yeah, so we, I'm just wondering, you know, what, what, whether you've done anything on supplements and masters? Um, personally, no, no, but that's not to say that it's, uh, it's a question that potentially needs answering. Um, does the physiology change over, over the, the, the life course? Um, and therefore, do things need difference in terms of supplementation? I mean, it might be in terms of protein requirements might be slightly differently, different. Um, so then probably better uh, people to answer that question than me. I know that um, uh, Dr. Jess Piazeki uh, from Nottingham Trent has done, she did quite a bit of work on um, master's athletes um, uh, a few years ago. Uh, and it, it comes down to different things, I think, in terms of um, bone health is one thing. Um, so... Um, how uh, bone health can change as you get older and can you take different supplements to help offset the degradation of bone as, as you age um, so things like that might be quite interesting to look at but yeah there's a there might be a few better people placed than me to answer that question sorry <laughs> thank you thanks Steve um Sarah did you have a question Hi, yep. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, Steve, for that great chat um, presentation. I had two questions. The first was about caffeine. So um, with regard to the study that you said athletes that had regularly taken doses, um, they built up a tolerance and weren't able to respond when they took it for performance effects. I was just curious what that amount is. Would that be even athletes that only have a cup of coffee a day? Would they no longer be able to achieve the benefits from caffeine uh, to enhance performance? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, it's, it's a very low level dose. They were taking on, I think it was 1.5 milligrams, which was then up to about three milligrams per kilo. So not a lot. And it does seem to have that sort of um, habitual effect. And you think a couple of cups of coffee a day soon adds up to, to sort of around those levels. Um, the issue with a lot of uh, ca uh, caffeine research is we, we often ask people to withdraw from caffeine for say 24 to 48 hours beforehand. So they kind of go from a from their normal level, they drop down to uh, a sort of withdrawal level and then bring it back up to where they normally were for their study. So yeah, it's it, it, you can get that habituation of coffee. So that's why we always try and when we do caffeine studies is either recruit people with similar low intakes or similar high intakes and kind of keep everyone in similar in terms of their preparation. Thanks. And I just had a second question about uh, CBD oil. Obviously, um, a lot of athletes struggle with sleep and that's an area that's pretty contested. And I know um, a lot of um, governing bodies would recommend athletes not take it because of the potential of contamination with THC. I was curious about um, herbal remedies and what athlete options might be um, if sleep is still a struggle and, and they don't want to um, risk the CBD. Um, <laughs> Again, good question. Um, difficult, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, the, that question might be closely linked to the previous question about the caffeine. Um, so there are definitely 
sleep protocols that many athletes go through and we've been to several conferences where they talk about sleep being a, a process from three 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 hours out or so from bedtime about shutting down things and doing things like that in terms of cbd um that's very emerging at the moment a colleague of mine is just doing some preliminary work with cbd at the moment it's, there's not much literature out there um in terms of herbal remedies in general a lot of caution um they're often they're probably higher risk in terms of contaminants higher risk in terms of fillers um, missing misled mislabeling different ingredients in so yeah very a lot of caution with them in terms of uh in terms of athletes and always look at what the other options are in terms of supplements aren't always the quickest fix is there other factors that can be done to to try and help with athlete health and performance thanks very much Thanks, Steve. And we've just got, I've had one more question come through, which I think will be the last one, and then we'll uh, wrap it up after this. So can you describe the differences in males and females in research findings? Um, the question, I thought it only was there when it came to ketones, but are there other differences as well? It's a, uh, again, a tricky question. Um, there are female, Studies in females are very underrepresented in, in uh, sport and exercise science, which is a shame because they should be, um, there should be as many studies as there are in males. Often researchers take the, the, the effect of, of doing it in males because it can be slightly more straightforward in terms of um, controlling for menstrual cycle and, and factors along those lines. Um, when we always talk about male versus female studies, we would say, oh, is there a physiological mechanism for why females would be any different to males um, it might be the hormonal profile across the menstrual cycle may affect how a supplement might work but that's in very few occasions um, from my perspective in terms of hydration and factors like that then it doesn't seem to be that different uh, there was a review published yesterday or day before looking at female athletes and hydration and there wasn't too much I don't think there was much difference in terms of how we view females it's just that they're very underrepresented in in the literature and I know I said that was the last one but I've just had one, <laughs> one more ping through as well but um so this really really will be the last one um so this was around uh, fast twitch muscle fibers using fats most efficiently as an energy source um and fast twitch fibers using carbohydrates as an energy source if if that's correct why would endurance athletes feel like fuel on carbs and sprinters use something like creatine if you take an endurance athlete and you measure their their what they're working at it's a, a very high percentage very high intensity if you take a marathon running runner they're working at an extremely high energy turnover um, and often we think that, oh, they might be using fats, but at that intensity, they are predominantly using carbohydrates. They are purely using carbohydrates. And that fat is quite an efficient fuel source. Um, it requires more oxygen to, um, to be able to liberate the energy. Um, it's not very efficient. Carbohydrate is much more efficient. Carbohydrate is definitely king. If you're talking about using fats, you're talking more sort of real prolonged endurance so 24 hours ultra endurance events things like that um so really we endurance runners are more in terms of carbohydrate that's the predominant fuel source and sprinters like i say mainly using a slightly different atp pcr which is the using phosphocreatine uh, to generate um uh, atp energy wise so a very slightly different energy system so sprinters aren't really very short aspects, not really using the carbohydrates and fats. Okay, that's really, really helpful. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, we are going to wrap it up there as we've run over um, a little bit. Uh, if you do still have questions, Steve did share his email address and Twitter handle at the end of his presentation, so I'm sure he would be happy to uh, answer any questions that come in via that way. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you very much, Steve, again, for your talk tonight. Really, really interesting. Thank you, uh, everybody that's attended as well for um, 
coming along this evening and uh, giving up your evening. We have recorded the session and we will be putting it online um, in the next few days and you will receive an email when that's available to view if you want to look at it again or, or share it with any colleagues. But thank you again very much, everybody, and uh, good night. We'll hopefully see you again soon.